Well, I want to thank you all for your, uh, your support of the various different uh, ministries that I've had an opportunity to be involved in here in the community. I'm in the middle right now of our last basketball tournament of the year. We had two games yesterday, we have two games tonight, and then we have uh, one game tomorrow. And I just wanna, I wanna thank you all for supporting us in that. It's been, a, it's been a great time to be able to get to know some families, to get to minister to the life of the, uh, the young ladies that we have on our team. Uh, it's a challenging uh, team, partly because it's the nicest group of girls I've ever coached in my life. Uh, it, it, they come from incredible families, uh, just a nice bunch of girls. And that's great. The challenge is, is because they're a nice bunch of girls, we don't win a lot of games. Because <laughs> we're not always playing against nice girls. And so, uh, so, so it's been, it, it's kind of one of those bittersweet, Phoebe asked me yesterday how I'm feeling about us, I'm coming to the end of this uh, spring season. I said, it's kind of bittersweet, uh, I need the break, uh, and I'm looking forward to it, but I also uh, just love coaching this group of girls, and I wanted to thank you for extending me that opportunity to be able to do that, uh, and, uh, and I'll get a little bit of a break now, because it's not till the end of the week that Black Bear season starts, so, so I'll get a couple days where I don't have an extra thing that I'm doing, so that's good, so... We're going to return to our series on being the bride of Christ next week. But part of being the bride of Christ is caring for one another, particularly caring for one another in times of crises. That is something that we're called to do as the bride of Christ. We have numerous ways of showing that we care for one another in the life of the church. But I believe that the greatest way that we care for one another is through prayer. So the power of prayer. Truth be told, the only weapons, if we're going to call them weapons, that God has given his church is the fellowship of the believers, God's word, and prayer. That's what he's given us. That's, that, that's the power that he's given us. But here's the thing. Those are exceptionally powerful. And so we need to put those into practice in our life. We talk, uh, we're going to talk about why we're specifically focusing on prayer here in a little bit. But before we get there, I want to look at one of the greatest narratives that I know in Scripture about the power of a praying church in the Bible. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts, if you haven't already turned there. Acts chapter 12, and we're going to look at Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 17. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 17. I'm going to start with the first five verses. It says here in Acts chapter 12, starting in verse 1, it says, About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. When he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Let's, before we dig into the actual text here, let's talk a little bit about the context of what's going on here. Uh, I had David read uh, a little bit earlier out of Acts chapter 2, and you saw the fellowship of the believers, and, and really it started off as a sweet fellowship. The church was small, but the church was mighty, and God was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved in the church, particularly the church in Jerusalem at this time, began to grow. If you remember at the beginning of the book of Acts, it really gives us an outline of, of how the gospel is going to go out. Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Here we see that, that this is where the gospel is going out to Jerusalem. However, we're going to see the beginnings here in chapter 12 of the gospel being spread out to Judea, Samaria, and then eventually to the ends of the earth. Churches experienced a number of ups and downs. One of the great down times of the church in Jerusalem was the martyrdom of Stephen. Stephen, a faithful man of God, was stoned to death as, as Saul, the persecutor of the church, stood over it, really giving leadership to it. But God had done some incredible things as well. God sent Peter to Cornelius, a Gentile, to bring the gospel to him, and it opened Peter's eyes up that, that salvation was not just for the Jews, that it was also for the Gentiles. And this was an earth-shattering, earth-moving experience for the church. Today we look at that and we go, oh yeah, that's old hat, we've seen that before. But for them, this was something that they didn't expect. 
It blew them away. They couldn't have possibly saw this coming. But yet God was at work in an incredible way. And then, if that wasn't enough, Saul, the persecutor of the church, was converted on the road to Damascus and was now in Antioch. And in Antioch, he is there being trained and developed and prepared for ministry. But yet, not all is well as we see here in the beginning of chapter 12. Herod Agrippa is the Herod that is mentioned here. Herod Agrippa the first, that is. And he has been put back into, or put into Israel as the king. Now understand, when we talk about a king under the Roman Empire, they're the king, but they're the king under the thumb of Rome. They, they, they serve at the behest of Rome. And Rome, just as easily as they put them in that position, could also take them out of the position. Because Rome honored above just about anything else what was called the Pax Romana, or the Roman peace. And the idea of the Pax Romana was that, that, that they, they gave the people this idea that they were self-governed, even though they really weren't. As long as the peace was kept, but if the peace was not kept, the Romans came down with an incredible wrath upon the people. So Herod Agrippa uh, grew up in Rome. In fact, he was, uh, he, he was, he was very much uh, enculturated within that, that world of the Roman world. We call it the Hellenistic culture. He was very Hellenized in everything that he did. Uh, and, and he grew up uh, being taught in all of the Roman schools. And then eventually they decided that they were going to go ahead and put him in Israel to be king over uh, the majority of the land of Israel. And that began under Caligula in A.D. 36. He was unpopular within the Jewish people, partly because uh, his father was Herod the Great. Okay? Or his grandfather was Herod the Great. Okay? Not exactly a loved guy, right? He was also mixed race uh, as an Edomite, and he also was very, as I said, very into the Hellenistic Roman culture. And, and so anytime that he was in Israel or in Jerusalem, we see him trying to kind of act like he's a, he's a full-on Jew. But outside of that context, he was very much a Roman citizen. Here what we see him doing is he's attempting to gain popularity, particularly with the Jewish religious establishment, uh, by going after and persecuting the enemies of this young upstart church that they wanted to get rid of. They hated the way, as it was called at that point. And they would do whatever they could to get rid of it. And so in order to appease them, he kills James, the brother of John. James, the brother of John, is murdered. He is one of the sons of Zebedee, and he's murdered uh, very likely through beheading. Could be that he was ran through with a sword or that he was, he was beheaded in the Roman way. Whichever way that is, he was uh, uh, murdered. And actually, interesting kind of little side note here, this is the only apostolic death that's recorded in the New Testament. The apostles, we know they all died. Okay. All but one of them we know died uh, uh, being martyred, but this is the only one that is mentioned in the New Testament. Everyone happens, other ones are, are mentioned outside of the New Testament. So one of the original apostles and a leader within the Jerusalem church has now been murdered. But the reality is, is that Jesus said this was going to happen. Jesus warned them that this was going to be happening. In fact, if you go back to Mark chapter 10, verse 38, I'll put it up on the screen back here. Mark 38, 39, it says, Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Now understand what, what's going on here is the two brothers, they wanted to be able to sit at, at, at his right hand and his left hand. They wanted the seats of power when Jesus came into their kingdom because they still believed that Jesus came as the Messiah that they expected. They expected a Messiah who would, who would uh, put Israel back in, into its sovereignty where they would have control of the land, that they would kick the Romans out and they would be there and they would be right by him as he was leading as a king. And so they ask him, or the mom asked, can I be on the right or left? So they're really arguing about who's the most important here. And so Jesus says, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. They had no idea what he was talking about, about the drink or the baptism. 
But Jesus tells them this. He said, Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I am baptized with, you will be baptized. And we know now that the baptism and the drink that he's talking about is that they would be killed. And that's what James experienced here. Well, that worked out so well for Herod Agrippa that he decided that they're going to go ahead and they're going to go after one of the other leaders. In fact, let's go after the most vocal leader of the church in Jerusalem. Let's go after Peter. So they arrest Peter during the Passover celebration. But now Herod has a problem here. He couldn't kill, he couldn't have Peter killed during the Passover celebration. It's too likely that there might be a riot during that time. Plus, it was illegal. Okay? Now, let's be honest, the religious leaders haven't always followed those rules 100%, have they? But it was illegal for them to do it, so Herod says, let's wait until after the feast, let's wait until after Passover, let's wait until after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then we'll go ahead and we'll get rid of him. So in the meantime, what they do with Peter is they put him under heavy guard. When it talks about four squads of soldiers, what that means is that there's four soldiers, uh, four groups of four soldiers that would watch him on a rotating basis. Two would guard outside, and then two would actually be chained to him. Why so much for Peter? Was it because Peter was such a threat? Well, no, it's because the religious leaders very likely warned him about Peter's escape that we see in Acts chapter 5. They said, you know what, this guy got out before, we need to keep extra watch on him. Yeah, we've got a great idea. We'll not only have guards outside, but we'll have guards chained to him. There's no way he's going to get out of that. Right? Well, not so much. <laughs> Key verse of these first five verses is this. But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Brings us to our first point this morning. It's this. When a crisis comes into the life of the church, the church earnestly prays. Say that again. When a crisis comes into the life of the church, the church earnestly prays. That term earnestly uh, is the Greek word ektenos, ektenos, and it's an adverb, okay, meaning it takes a verb and does what? Modifies a verb, right? You're like, this is not English class, it's church. And it really means in a serious manner, okay? So, so they pray, that's the verb, okay? But it modifies it by saying that they, seri they took prayer seriously. They, they, they did it with great passion. They recognized that they're facing a crisis. Their beloved Peter has been arrested and is probably going to be killed. James has already been killed. You know, reading this, we, 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 can, we can fall into the, the, the temptation of looking to the end. And if you're familiar with the story, you know how the story turns out. She's like, oh, it's okay, no problem. But, but like I was talking with the kids earlier, when we read this, we kind of have to put ourselves in the place of the early church. What were they feeling at the time? Imagine for a second the leaders of your church being arrested, one of them being killed, another one being arrested and likely to be killed on trumped-up charges that you knew were unjust. I hope that you wouldn't go, yeah, all right, no big deal. Just got to start a search committee. No, you would, you would, you would, your heart would be heavy. You'd be in crisis mode. Hopefully you'd gather together to pray earnestly. That's what's going on here. The term earnestly is used two other times in the New Testament. Once in Luke chapter 22, verse 44. In the Garden of Sinai, it says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Does that sound like a passive, casual thing? No. And then later on in 1 Peter, Peter writes this, he says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly with a, pur a pure heart. 
serious love, to really truly love one another, to show that love in real, impactful ways. Casual, half-hearted prayer is not earnest prayer. That's not what's going on right here. This is not a casual, half-hearted thing. This is a desperate people crying out to God to do something that they can't do. <clears throat> to intervene in a situation that they have no control over. That's what they're doing. Throughout Acts, prayer is the early church's response to everything. In fact, if you look in the learning guide, I gave a list of a bunch of texts in Acts. All of those are areas where the church comes together to pray. Really, the book of Acts, there's a lot of things. By the way, the book of Acts is my favorite book in the New Testament, so I get pretty excited about it. But, but here's, the, here's the thing about the book of Acts. Okay? It's not only the Acts of the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit works through the church and the incredible things that he did, does, but we can also say about the book of Acts, this happened, the church prayed, and then this happened. Over and over again we see, something happens, what does the church do? Church prays. That's what the church does. The church prays. And that should be our response as well. The church prays. Particularly at times where our brothers and sisters are facing crisis in their life. We ought to pray. If you're on our prayer chain, and you get those prayer requests. We ought to stop what we're doing if we can. If you're driving, don't stop what you're doing right then, okay? <laughs> but we ought to stop what we're doing and pray. Because if somebody took the time to ask me, to ask other people to pray, it's serious to them. It might not seem serious to you at the moment, but it's serious to them. And if we really want to show love to them, we ought to stop and pray for them. It's important. Well, let's go on and look more at the story. Look what happens in verse 6. It says, Now when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and centuries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in his cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to them, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know uh, that what was being done to him by the angel was real, but thought that, it was, that he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them on its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. So think about this scene for a second. Peter is sleeping. Okay? He's chained between two soldiers who are also clearly sleeping. He's sound asleep. Notice he wasn't expecting anything other than death. Peter's expectation at this point was death. But yet we see no desperation in Peter. We see no complaining. We see no bargaining. Instead, you know what Peter is doing? He's sleeping. Now I gotta tell you, I've been in major distress a couple times in my life. Anybody else? When I'm in major distress, you know what I don't do? Sleep soundly. I'm not in major distress right now. I don't sleep soundly right now either. <laughs> Peter is soundly sleeping. How do we know he's soundly sleeping? The angel has to kick him. <laughs> Get up! Wake up! He's sound asleep. I can't fathom that, but it reveals a man who has grown from being a denier of Christ to a confident man in life or in death. He recognizes that God's purposes will be fulfilled in his life, whether he's alive or whether he's about to die. So he can sleep peacefully. And it says an angel of the Lord. Now, sometimes we see this term, angel of the Lord, and people like to kind of classify angels in different ways. 
And we need to stay away from that. You know what? You know who the angel of the Lord is? It's an angel who came from the Lord. That's what it tells us. That's what's important about it. The angel came from the Lord to get Peter where he needed to be. Don't focus your attention on the angel. The angel is not the focus of this text. He helps, but the angel is not the focus of the text. God is the focus of the text. God is the one that has delivered Peter. See, Peter doesn't escape from jail. Don't make the mistake of saying, this is Peter's great escape. It's not. Peter does not escape from jail. Peter is delivered from jail. How do we know that? Because Peter doesn't even realize what's going on. Throughout this text, Peter has to be walked step by step through things. Wake up. Put your clothes on. Come with me. Walk through this gate. Don't go that way. The whole time, Peter's just kind of groggy. He's like, oh, I don't know where I'm at here right now. And he thinks he's going through a vision at this point. Peter is not escaping. Peter is delivered by God. God can rescue his people when and how he chooses. Brings us to our next key text in this section. It's this. When Peter says, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me. The point is this. It's our second point of this message. The Lord will rescue his people when he has more for them to accomplish. Say it again. The Lord will rescue his people when he has more for them to accomplish. Unlike what some teachers will tell you today, this isn't a promise of God's deliverance from all challenges. Prayer is not some sort of magical lamp where if we just pray a certain way, a certain amount of times, that we're going to get all of our wishes to come true. That's not what it says at all. God chooses to intervene at times, and at other times he doesn't intervene, at least in a way that we can discern. There's no magic to it. Don't ever find yourself in the situation where you're like, well, I've prayed about this, and God hasn't given me the desire of my heart, so he must not be listening. No, I promise you God is listening. He just has a will that's greater than your want. Question should always be, as we look at this text, why did God save Peter? Why is it that God saved Peter? It's because he had more for him to do. He had more work for Peter to do. Peter's job was not done yet. He was not completed. It would be one day, and at that point, Peter would not be rescued. <coughs> because he had fulfilled what God had called him to do. But at this point, Peter had more, or God had more for Peter to do. So why would God save us from our various different kinds of suffering and challenges that we face? It's the exact same reason because he has more for us to do. If God is going to save us, if God is going to help us in our distress, he has more for us to do. If not, then he's ready for us to hear the most beautiful words in all of creation. Well done, my good and faithful servant. So guess what? That says as the church, we win either way. We win either way. Either God has more for us to do, well, we're about to hear the greatest words that we could ever imagine here. Look at verse 12 and following. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came and answered Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but she ran and reported it, uh, that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. 
And he said to them, tell these things to James and to the, to the brothers. Uh, then he departed and went to another place. So what is Peter's first reaction? Peter goes to a house church in Jerusalem. All the churches in that day were house churches. All of them were, were places where homes where people opened up their homes for the church to come to meet. They didn't have fancy buildings like we have today. They met in churches. People showed hospitality. They opened up their homes so that the church could come together and meet. They meet. He goes to this house church that he knows there, and he runs into a lady that we don't know her name, but we know her son. Her son is John Mark. One of the things that Luke does throughout Acts is that he, he uses foreshadow. So he introduced somebody, and then a couple chapters later, that person will become an important person. John Mark, in this case, is one who would go with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, but then he would abandon. He would leave. Later on, he came back. It's actually kind of a fascinating story because the, the, the breakup between Barnabas and, and, and Paul was over John Mark. Barnabas wanted to bring John Mark with Paul said, no, he abandoned last time. I don't want him with us. And so we see this tension there, and the tension was so sharp that Barnabas went one way, Paul went the other way, and they didn't serve together anymore. But what's fascinating about John Mark's story is that at the end of, uh, of, of uh, Paul's life, one of his last letters that he wrote, Paul mentions John Mark. And he says, John Mark is useful to me. So at some point, and we don't know when it happened, Paul not only forgave John Mark, but John Mark came to a place where he started to be useful to the work of the Lord again. So he's a great story of how we can fail, but that God can still use us. So we're introduced to John Mark here. And what we see, many of the people in the church, this is where they were gathering, this is where they were praying earnestly for Peter. What exactly were they praying for Peter? We don't know. But we can imagine that they were praying that God would save him, that God would rescue him, that something would intervene. Guess what happened? Something intervened. And there's Peter knocking at the gate. And a servant girl named Rhoda comes. She recognizes his voice. She's like, yes! Now what she, she, what she should have done is what? Open the door. Okay? But she's so excited, she just can't. She just wants to go tell everybody, Peter's outside. And their reaction is, our prayers have been answered. We knew God would come through for us. We're going to go and open the door, right? No, nope. they're like, you're crazy! You really want us to believe that what we've been praying... Happened? You're out of your mind, girl. She's insistent. It's like, well, what you must have seen is his angel. What does that mean? Well, some people have said it's his guardian angel. We don't even know if there's such a thing as a guardian angel. We just don't know. Angels are ministering spirits. That's what, what, what Scripture tells us about them. It doesn't get into a whole lot of detail about them. Why? Because they have a specific role, and God doesn't want us to get focused on angels and not focus on Him. Okay? That's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to focus on, you know, it reminds me, my one brush with fame in my life was after our honeymoon, April and I were, we we were we went to Hawaii, and then we we. Uh, got uh, let off at the uh, the uh, SeaTac Airport, and uh, we've, if you go to the international flights, and for some reason Hawaii is an international flight, so you, you, you get off, you have to go on this little tram, and so we were like, we thought we were going to miss the tram, so we're running there, and we jump on the tram, get on there, and I just about knocked over this guy in a cowboy hat, and this guy in a cowboy hat, he's standing here with his, his hand over his face, kind of out over there, and I looked around, and there's all these people dressed around with him, like dressed in black, I'm like, wait a minute. And so I look at him and realize, that's Bob Dylan. I'm standing right next to Bob Dylan. I just about knocked over Bob Dylan. That would have been a story. And so I had two things going through my head at the same time. 
And I think April knew it, even though we'd only been married for, you know, a, 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 a week. Because she's like, she looks at me, she goes, don't do it. <laughs> she knew I was going to do something, and what part of me wanted to go, Dad, is that you? <laughs> My mom met you at, 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 sometime in the 60s, and it got, oh, no. <laughs> you know? I decided not to do that, uh, but then I, I thought about it for a second, I thought, you know what I should do? I should look around and go, hey, are you guys all Bob Dylan's roadies and make a big deal about them and not even focus on Bob Dylan? <laughs> See, that's what, what, what we do when we, when we focus on angels and not on God. We focus on the roadies and not the star. So they saw him. They finally recognized that, okay, let's go, let's go see. Let's go see what's going on. They open the door, and there's Peter. What they prayed for has come true. Imagine that. Key verse. He described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. What's our point? It's this. We should pray expecting that God will hear our prayers and respond according to his purposes. Again, we should pray expecting that God will hear our prayers and respond according to his purposes. Ask yourself this question. Do you really pray with confidence, knowing that God not only hears your prayers, but that he answers them as well? I gotta be honest. Sometimes in my life I've struggled with this. I prayed for things, and it hasn't turned out the way that I wanted them to. And I began to wonder, does God actually even listen to my prayers? Does my prayers even matter? That's when I get in my whiny phase. Anybody have a whiny phase? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good at it. Okay, I'll be honest. I get on my kids about whining sometimes, and I hear God saying, oh, really? Sometimes in those, those moments, I, it's because I don't notice what God is doing. I don't realize that he has a better plan, a, a something more important for me. But i, I got to be honest. Sometimes I pray, and I don't expect. Glory be that even though we see this in the early church, that they were praying and they didn't expect, that God still blessed them. Amen? Amen. It's good to know that God can work with people with weak faith, right? Is that amen or oh me? I mentioned earlier that the church has only three weapons when it comes to spiritual warfare and a personal crisis. The fellowship of the believers is one of those. So we come together for support. It's a defensive weapon. Sometimes, though, that defensive weapon, we feel like it lets us down, right? And it can, let's be honest. Why? Because it's full of human beings. And sometimes hurt people hurt people, don't they? It happens sometimes but it's still an incredibly powerful weapon. God's word is a powerful weapon. In fact, Scripture says that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. But I believe the greatest and most powerful of all of these is prayer. Why? Because anyone can do it. You don't have to be able to read to pray. You don't have to be a biblical scholar to pray. You don't have to be able to go to church to pray. We can all pray. You don't have to have some great prayer. When, when I was a young Christian, I used to hear people that were like uh, just incredible spiritual giants in my eye and prayer and think, well, I'll never be able to pray like that. Then I knew some other people that for whatever reason, they thought when they prayed, they needed to speak in King James English. Anybody ever seen anybody something like that? They speak like normal every other time, but then they, they pray, they Oh, thou Lord, I beseech thee. You're like, what in the world? <laughs> God doesn't understand regular language? It's like, oh, well, you spoke, you, you prayed King James, now you know what's going to happen. God will hear the simplest of prayers. A prayer where we mutter and meander where we can't find the words, where we don't know what to say, God will hear those prayers. What an incredibly powerful weapon. In his graciousness, the God who created everything, who sustains everything, who understands everything, not only welcomes our prayers, but he answers them. 
How does he do that? I have no idea. And I'd love to tell you that we'll understand him in glory. I don't think we will. But he does. And it's good. His answers aren't always what we expect, but they're always for our good and for his glory. So I want to talk about the challenge. It's one of the most practical and urgent challenges that I've ever laid out. It's one that I got to tell you, I told April on many occasions this week, I've agonized over this. Not because I don't love the text, I do love the text. Not because I don't know the text, I know this text very well. It's because for me, and for many of you, this is truly a time where we as a church need to be earnestly in prayer. My dear friend and somebody who I've become close to over the last couple of years through prayer and through just getting to sit down and talk, Mike Lerma, texted me this week, and, and his, his text was very simple. It just said, Diana needs a miracle. Diana needs a miracle. And I knew when, as soon as I read that, God kind of put on my heart in a very, very clear way something that we need to do. We need to earnestly be in prayer for Diana. As many of you know, Diana has cancer. And the medical field doesn't have all the answers when it comes to that, but we know who does. And so my challenge for us as a church is to pray, and it's not just a, a casual, I'm going to throw it out there. I actually have an idea of what I want us to do. This Tuesday, May 28th, I'd like to make it a day of prayer for Diana Lerman. My challenge is this, as members of this church, of her church, of a church that she has served for many, many, many years, I want us to earnestly pray for Diana for 12 hours as a church. Now, I'm not saying that all of you need to pray for 12 hours straight. What I'm asking for is, is I'm going to send a sign-up sheet around here in just a, a few minutes. And I'm going to ask you for sign up for a block of time. And each one of those, there's, there's an hour block of time. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to write your name on that for one of those hour blocks of time. And then a contact, whether it's your email, whether it's a text messaging phone number, or a calling phone number. Make sure if it's a text message, you write text. If it's a phone, just write phone on there. Um, the reason for that is I would like to have, during that 12-hour span, Somebody from our church praying for Diana during all those times. <clears throat> and if there's multiple people at a time, I'd like us to I'd like to be able to share numbers. So if you want to pray together, you can do that. If you'd like to come to the church to pray, you can do that. If you'd like to go somewhere else to pray, or if you just want to get on the phone. Now some of you might go on, I don't know if I can pray for an hour. Because here's the reality. Sometimes if you're like me, you sat down and you said, I want to pray. I want to pray for an hour, or I want to pray for half an hour. And you start praying, and you look up, and it's been five minutes. Anybody ever been there? Okay. What I'm saying is during that hour, stop on multiple occasions, whatever you're doing, and pray. If you can pray for an hour, by all means, do it. If you can pray for half an hour, do it. If you can pray for 15 minutes, do it. I'm less concerned about the length of time that we pray and far more concerned about the fact that we need to pray. For, for many of you, Diana has been such an incredible, impactful person in your life. She's been an incredibly impactful person. Diana and I have a special relationship. We banter back and forth a lot. We've done it really since the day we first met. We tease each other all the time. And I know I've had somebody before hear kind of the way we talk to each other go, oh, how can you say that? <laughs> it's, it's all done out of love. It's, it's all done out of a, of a mutual admiration for the work that they have done and that she specifically has done here in this church and throughout this convention of the Northwest Baptist Convention. Dan Lerman has always been an incredibly impactful person. And I know that for many of you, she's had a great impact in your life also. 
So I'm asking you to be willing to spend an hour this week on Tuesday praying, praying that God would do a miracle. How would he do that? I don't know. Is it a guarantee that he will do it? I don't know. But all I know is this. The greatest weapon that we have, the greatest weapon we have in our tool belt is prayer. So let's pray for our sister, Diana. I'm going to pass the sheet out right here in just a second. The first thing I want to do is I want to go ahead and do just what I'm talking about right now and pray. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for your grace. We thank you for the fact that we can come to you in prayer. We can come to you at prayer during the times that are just the neutral times, like every other time of life. We can come to you during the good times. But, Lord, we can also come to you during the crises and the desperate times. And, Lord, we come to you right now, and we bring our sister, Diana Lerma, to you. Lord, I know Diana well enough to know that she doesn't like to be on center stage. She doesn't like to be the focus. But, Lord, she's had so much impact on so many of us. And so, Lord, we are asking for a miracle. We're asking that you would do something that the medical field could not understand, and that they would all just go, we don't understand it. We would love that because it would be a situation where you and you alone would get the glory, and we would give it to you. But, Lord, regardless of what you're going to do in this situation, Lord, we want to come and we want to bring our sister before you. Lord, we want to thank you for for just blessing us with her, and Lord, we pray now that we can bless her through praying for her throughout this week, but particularly on Tuesday. Lord, we thank you for your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.